Good morning and welcome to the third session in the eight session series on cannabis equity and racial justice. I'm Jim Ketty with Youth Forward. This series is being hosted by the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, Youth Forward and the California Urban Partnership. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, the California Endowment, the Center at Sierra Health Foundation, California Wellness Foundation, the Liberty Hill Foundation, California Community Foundation, the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, and the California Department of Healthcare Services. Uh, this session will be recorded and will be placed on the YouTube channels of the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color and Youth Forward. Within a couple days, we will be emailing everyone who has registered for the session a link to the recording and the slides. Towards the end of the session, we will have some time for Q&A, so please feel free to put questions and reactions in the comments section below the video and YouTube. This morning, we have come together with the goal of increasing awareness of the need to approach all aspects of cannabis policy and the implementation of Proposition 64 from the lens of racial justice and equity. In our first session, we explored how the criminalization of cannabis has played a major role in mass incarceration and in policies and practices that have disproportionately harmed and continue to harm black people, indigenous people, and people of color for decades in California. In our second session, we looked at the state grant programs that are currently being funded by state cannabis <laughs> revenues and the need to invest these revenues in communities of color impacted by the war on drugs with the goal of repairing some of the harm caused by mass incarceration. Today, we are seeking to support the youth development and youth organizing fields by having a conversation regarding youth engagement during COVID-19. We are aware that school closures, the inability to bring young people together face-to-face -face, and the stress and anxiety caused by the pandemic have had a harsh impact on young people in numerous ways and on the youth field. COVID-19 has had a particularly harsh impact on youth of color and system impacted youth and their families with disproportionately high rates of disease and death, job loss, housing insecurity, and even greater traumatization. In the fall of last year, we decided to carry out research on how youth organizations were coping with the pandemic and how they were adapting their practices to this new reality with support from the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development and the Department of Healthcare Services, we conducted surveys of their youth serving Prop 64 grantees, followed up by some select interviews. In this session, we will share the research findings and then we'll have uh, some response and dialogue with top practitioners in youth development and youth organizing in our state. And I'm happy now to turn the presenter role over to our lead researcher on this project, my friend and colleague, Audrey Jordan, who will share with you the research findings. Thank you, Jim. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to Youth Forward staff, to my partners on the project, Cherie Tang and Melinda Mendez Campos. And thank you to the respondents, uh, both for the survey and the interviews. Um, I'm Audrey Jordan, um, and I'm going to present a high-level overview of the findings of, of our surveys and interviews. Next, please. So before I jump into the particulars, I want to um, just have you leave with these big points or highlights, takeaways. Um, first of all, the response rate, even though it was 40%, was higher than I expected, higher than a typical survey response rate. And that's pretty remarkable given we were in the midst of COVID-19. Um, it said to me that people were enthusiastic about um, sharing their, their voice, um, giving their perspective. Second, youth serving organizations are remarkable and they have been adaptive and innovative under extraordinary circumstances. I heard that in the uh, survey comments, as well as the interview responses, where I spoke with executive directors who basically talked about the can-do attitude that their staff had that got them through. Thirdly, um, youth engagement and participation did continue, and for some even increased, which was surprising. Although 
it was significantly challenged across the board. Um, you'll see a slide later that gives particulars on that. Another big point that comes out of uh, the findings is that the leadership and perspective of young people was just that much more powerfully realized by a majority of, of the respondents. Um, in many cases, it was the voice and perspective of youth that provided the innovations necessary to uh, keep going. The necessity of partnerships among organizations uh, really also got elevated. The importance of supporting each other and finding support with the young people and their families got clearer than it ever was. So just a little background as I get into the particulars. Um, this research focused on how the Prop 64 grantees in youth development in California were and are adapting to this new COVID-19 reality. The online survey was conducted in November of 2020 and of 117 respondents, 40 actually completed the entire uh, survey. We followed up with phone interviews for a select group of people and nine of 10 key informants were able to schedule and talk with me and my colleagues during the month of December. So a little bit about those 40 respondents. 55% uh, of them were identified themselves as Elevate Youth grantees and 45% identified as California Community Reinvestment Grants grantees. 82% of the organizations identified themselves as uh, organizations that serve the LGBTQI community. And 72% were primarily urban with 18% primarily rural. 10% responded other. Um, this slide gives you just a little bit of the characteristics of the respondents, um, the organizations, uh, the youth populations they served. Um, and you can see a, a spread of diversity uh, across Hispanic or Latino, white, black, African American, et cetera, in terms of race, ethnicity. And then the, uh, with, with the predominant uh, group of folks being Hispanic, Latino, served, youth served in California. And with the age range being most organizations serving between youth between the ages of 12 to 26. Um, so that those are the high points of those data that I would say. Now we get to some of the responses and questions. Um, in terms of the impact of the pandemic on the services and supports, we gave a wide array of different services and supports that these youth serving organizations provide. And the top four areas that were most challenged, uh, not surprisingly, were being able to meet with participants. Um, you can see that was at 95%. Outreach and engagement efforts were challenged. Um, about 85% of the respondents said so. Relationship building, um, and then access to basic needs and including mental health services were also challenged. And you can see some of the quotes that we were able to pull um, from those respondents. Here's the slide that really helps us see what the impact of the pandemic was on youth participation. And with the red 40%, you see 40% responded that youth participation actually declined uh, be, uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic, um, well, aftermath, while the pandemic's in place. Um, and 33% stayed the same, with that 22% surprisingly reporting how um, youth engagement and participation has grown. What's been most helpful? Um, of course, uh, being able to use social media um, in, in a variety of formats, some new to some of the organizations, um, uh, responding to where the youth go, things like Instagram and TikTok, et cetera. Phone calls, text messaging were also helpful in engaging young people. Um, you can see the responses here. I don't need to read them. I think um, 
these make sense in terms of ways folks had to adapt and innovate to be able to um, continue providing those services and engaging the youth. Family were important. Um, one positive that uh, was cited by a couple of respondents was because transportation was not the issue that it typically is. Um, in some instances that helped uh, engage young people. Um, what's been most helpful continued, of course, the staff and, and just their all in attitude and youth leaders and alumni who stepped up to pitch in. Some schools were especially helpful in terms of providing access to students and supporting their participation. Um, being able to co communicate more often and follow up. That was really, really important. More texting, more calls. Um, retaining was easier than recruiting is, is a message that we heard. Um, so once the youth were engaged, it was easier to keep them engaged than it was to engage new youth. And then other agencies not being able to be responsive um, made the youth serving organizations that much more uh, present. And in many cases, uh, the interviewers, interviewees in particular mentioned how they realized how much of a trusted entity they really were in the community. What will be continued post pandemic? Well, the using the virtual space um, proved to be a real enhancement. Um, the ability to engage funders and other partners in particular is something that folks mentioned might, they may continue to, to do virtually as opposed to in person. Um, and then using the technology tools, uh, some new to people, and then finding ways to get Chrome tablets and other uh, materials and resources to the youth themselves is important, and boosting internet access. The basic needs that youth and their families have came through loudly and clearly and will continue to be something that youth serving organizations seek more funds to support. Um, evaluation doing online proved to be possible and folks talked about being able to, to do that. And then providing those sort of virtual drop-ins, virtual chats. Um, uh, the, the need to translate curriculum into other languages in virtual space is something that folks will continue to do and will need support to do more of. I asked folks what they really learned, their key takeaways. Um, uh, the idea of continuing to seek improvements in technology, being current making sure you're engaging with the technology that's most uh, engaging to youth is very important and finding innovative ways to provide services in virtual space. Um, community engagement and, and ways to do that um, that are innovative is important. People talked about the use of music and using those spaces in a healing kind of way, um, very, very important. Um, Partnering with other organizations virtually, uh, really, really uh, an important thing. Uh, for example, partnering to access funding and working together in um, coordinated strategies was a, a, a measure of success. Um, and being prepared for emergencies. Um, this was a real lesson and will continue to be. What kinds of things would uh, these youth serving organizations look for that would be helpful to them. Getting access to the latest virtual apps and technology, um, being able to use all of the bells and whistles of Zoom and other uh, virtual app, uh, platforms would be, and training for that. Uh, having better and more availability of, of, of broadband Wi-Fi, um, Funding support to help with the technology needs, even the, the, the Chromebooks and uh, computers, laptops themselves. Um, 
how do you adapt your advocacy and organizing work in virtual space? And the good news is we have some folks on the panel who could speak to that, uh, given their experience with it. And then, um, of course, I mentioned those language translation supports and better ways to improve uh, youth leadership and participation in virtual space. These are some additional comments I got that added a little bit more texture from the interviews. Um, you can see that um, just the idea of involving youth uh, in more leadership and following their lead uh, was, was really um, an important win-win, uh, mutual benefit for both the organizations and the young people themselves. The idea of being more uh, responsive around mental health needs uh, that really, really amped up for more people in more intensive ways, how to cope and deal um, in a pandemic, et cetera. And then just really uh, being aggressive about eliminating technology barriers. Next slide, please. Okay, <laughs> that was it. Thank you very much. These were uh, the findings. Thank you so much, Audrey, for that presentation on how youth serving organizations are adapting during COVID. I'm continually impressed by the youth development field and how creative they're getting with supporting uh, young people during this difficult time. Uh, we're a little uh, behind on time, uh, but if you could share with me your experience experience with interviewing these organizations and what you took away from it, that would be great um, in like one minute. <laughs> yeah, I think my biggest takeaway, uh, Sarah Michael, is uh, I was already impressed with people who work with young people in these organizations, but these are some amazing heroic people. One comment that sticks in my mind was, you know, we didn't, we were ready to close down when the pandemic hit, but we were told we were emergency responders. And it made us realize, yeah, we are. We are that go-to place in our communities and it inspired us and we stepped up. So I think that's exemplary of the kind of folks who run these organizations. That is so true. Uh, these organizations really have had to come together and work even hard for their communities because you know, who else is going to come through? And and I think that they really had to uh, provide more than uh, what they were doing, you know, regarding basic needs um, and, uh, and, you know, mental health and then, you know, all the virtual uh, necessities. So uh, thank you for that. I'd also uh, like to remind people to put questions in the comments so that we may address a few of them towards the end. Uh, specific questions about the research findings would be great, as well as questions uh, for our youth practitioners once we, when we get to that. But next, I would like to introduce uh, Marcus L. Strether, pre President and CEO of Mentor California, which is an organization whose mission is to fuel the quality and quantity of mentoring relationships for California young people and to close the mentoring gap. Uh, he will talk a little bit about his thoughts on uh, this research and then his own experience with supporting mentoring efforts across the state. Appreciate it, Sarah. It's great to be here. Audrey, amazing job. I love all of what you presented. Uh, and it really does speak to uh, what we see not only uh, in California, but across our great nation and just how important our community educators, our community advocates, mentoring and what that looks like and what young people need for themselves. Uh, Jim actually shared with me today, earlier this morning, New York Times just put out an article, the importance of mentoring, right? And, and how this pandemic has really pushed that out. And I think something that I wanna share immediately is that mentoring is a basic human right. It is something that all young people as well as adults should have in their life. And when I think about this and I think about the findings, a couple things stand out. And I'm gonna to try to get us back on time, Sarah, because so, we have amazing speakers that I, I, I wanna be able to get in and have time with them. So community and connection, right? How are we staying committed to community and connection? When we think about the state of California, Mentor California is that we're that in-between. 
We work with mentoring programs and youth development programs to be able to help train, uh, create opportunities for advocacy, uh, which we have our national summit coming up next week. We'll be doing a Capitol Hill Day. We have 72 uh, great folks across the state that are gonna be joining us to speak to our legislators. Um, but we are looking at how can we be in a place where we can support them with community and connection. You know, to some of Audrey's points, uh, 50, almost 50% 50 of the programs that we work with here in California operate with four or fewer staff. It's tough when we have adults who are trying to get in spaces with young people or we have young people who need adults, but we just don't have the funding to be able to bring people on board. Because as much as, you know, we got that hard work and we wanna be in the space with young people to be able to support, you know, we also have to be able to live. We also have to be able to take care of ourselves as adults as well. Um, I think the other piece that stood out to me was really thinking about R&R. &R, and I don't mean rest and relaxation, although that is a plus. I'm talking about relationships and relevancy. The importance of relationships, I think about George who's on this panel over the last five years, I've been able to be in spaces with him and consistently uh, am inspired by how he can create relationship with young people, but also create relationships uh, in spaces where he is able and others are able to move the needle for this movement. But then we think about relevancy. Young people, we just did a, a focus group with about 17 young people a couple weeks ago. And one of the things that they said to me that was great, and I'm, you know, Audrey, I'm in the same boat with you. This is one of those things that stood out. They said, adults, y'all think, overthink this way too much. I, first off, stop making me an appointment in your calendar. If I'm an appointment in your calendar, then you don't care about me the way I need you to care about me, right? They said, this can work. There are ways that we can do this virtually um, that makes sense for us as young people. I think to the point of, you know, we don't have to find rides to go and be able to connect. Um, and how do we find other virtual apps that are out there? There's one that was created by young people. It's called um, I'm Not Okay, right? Or uh, Not Okay is just what it is. Not I'm Not Okay. Not, it's just Not Okay. And it's very simple where young people can put 10 people into their app adults that are caring adults that they can reach out to. And if they feel like they need some support, they hit a button on that app and it sends out a message to all 10 of those adults that says, I'm not okay, can somebody reach out to me? Once they're done with that and they have the conversation with, let's say a gym who checks in with that young person, they can then hit the button again and it'll send out another message that will say, I'm okay, I'm good, I appreciate it, I talked to Jim, I'm in a great place. The last thing I'll talk about again, thinking about how we get on time uh, is a a right? How can we make sure that our young people have access to us as adults? And how do we also make sure that we're available to them? And the young people said, it doesn't mean that if I call you, you drop everything and come to me because I know you have a life. I know you have things that you have to do. But knowing that I can check in with you and you may say to me, I can't call you right at this moment, but I will. I got you. Don't worry. I'm here to support you. Um, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, you know, our youth development programs, uh, our after school programs, our community educators are working hard. And I know when I was at Sac City Unified School District over the last five years before I stepped into Mentor California, uh, we had young people we couldn't find immediately when we started this virtual social distancing work. It was community educators here in Sacramento that were able to go out and find those young people, make the connection and get them back into school. So it's important for us to think about how do we continue to uh, support um, one with funding so that folks can have staff and can make sure that adults have what they need to be able to be in a good place. But it's also important for us to think about how do we make ourselves relevant? How do we build relationships? How do we make ourselves available and accessible? And how do we stay committed to connection and community? The last thing I'll say, Sarah, is that mentoring is a solution strategy to physical, emotional, and mental health. In some way, we need to get our lawmakers to understand that mentoring should be a part of the public health definition so that our community partners can go after public health dollars that are available because it is important for our young people to know that they have one caring adult at the end of the day that they could check in with and be able to know that the support is there in a huge way. And whether that be through ACES and using mentoring as a strategy to, to uh, combat ACES, um, whether it be 
uh, just a young person who is in need for a conversation, uh, mentoring is a solution strategy, strategy for that. So I think the more that we can dive into those pieces, the more that we can pay attention to that, we can affect um, a bigger pandemic that Dr. Vivek Murthy talked about in his book together. Loneliness has been a pandemic for us for much longer than COVID-19. Again, youth development advocates, mentoring, uh, those folks that are on the streets doing the work every day, uh, they are, we are a solution strategy to be able to combat loneliness, to be able to love on our young people in a way that makes sure that they feel supported. Um, and I think Audrey and all of what she spoke to in her slides and what she got from the interviews just lends itself to say that mentoring uh, this work that we are doing is more important than ever. Uh, and if anybody uh, can help us to be able to get into a place where we can get lawmakers to better understand that, particularly here in the state of California, uh, let's work together and make that happen. Wow, uh, Marcus, thank you so much for that. I was just thinking about how um, you, know, you were talking about elevating uh, mentorship and, um, and you know, thinking about the young people today, I think truly um, having a relationship with somebody they trust and that they know supports them is so, so important. And, uh, you know, I can just think about, you know, people in my own life that um, you know, I'm, you know, trying to be there for, and I think that even our young people are understanding that the mentors, they have lives themselves too, and so, uh, you know, that is, is also something that they're holding, and, and that they're, you know, not trying to be, um, you know, too all, you know, I need, I need, uh, and, and I think that's what makes a relationship great, is like, you know, looking at, you know, the give and take, and, um, and how can, you know, I support you and you support me, because uh, it really is uh, reciprocal. So uh, thank you. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's, that's I would just say that if, if the relationship is built the right way, Sarah, um, the adult gets just as much out of that as the young person. Agreed. Uh, well, now uh, I'm glad uh, to turn the mic over to Jim for the panel discussion where I'm sure we'll you know, continue more about, uh, you know, youth development and what uh, they're facing right now. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, so next we're going to hear from three more practitioners, three more outstanding people working in this field. Uh, we have with us Ashley Rojas from Fresno Barrios Unidos, Antonio Delfino with California Health Collaborative, and George Calvis with Communities United for Restorative Youth Justice, also known as Courage. Courage. And we've asked, to, uh, we've asked them to share with you uh, some of the challenges they have faced in uh, supporting young people during the pandemic and what they have learned along the way. So without further ado, let's start with Ashley. Hi folks, um, this is Azul. She works behind me all day, so she's here with us too. Um, <clears throat> uh, to, to challenge, I feel like doesn't totally encompass the experience that 2020 was in leading youth serving organizations through what felt like um, compounding crisis. Um, <clears throat> as a second year executive director, it was certainly the most um, challenging experience of, of my professional life. And um, it, it brought to life a lot of the issues um, that our young people are navigating every day in pre-pandemic um, in a way that was really undeniable with lots of added urgency and so we really had to get um grounded um and implement number one staff wellness strategies to ensure that our staff are taking good care um, of themselves so that we could show up for young people and so we implemented a three hours a day wellness time um for staff um, and they opted to co-create spaces to engage in ind individual activities and group activities. And I think that really communicated to us the same sort of support and or um, connection or, or felt connection that our young people were also craving. Um, and so for most of my staff were under 30, which made our pivot to like this online digital space um, smoother, I think, than some of our partners here locally anyway. Um, we had maintained active online spaces with our young people. Um, and, you know, Gen Z, they, they are digital organizers. Um, whether they call themselves that or not, they live in digital spaces. They have tons of different digital communities. Um, and so it was really about ensuring that young people had the access to the tech 
um, tablets, Wi-Fi, um, et cetera, so that they can um, tap in, right, uh, in their own language, tap into those digital communities. Um, and um, not just communities around building capacity or education or wellness, but really just spaces to um, be in relationship, to cultivate and experience joy. Um, we held a lot of um, game nights. They played Among Us. Um, together and putting folks in different rooms and letting them just meet other young people and play. I think that's something that we really um, want to elevate more is, is, you know, where does play live in our strategic plan? Where does joy live in our strategic plan? Um, because it's so critical to those relationships. Um, and uh, we were able to um, win a couple of local contracts um, from our city government uh, by leveraging young people as influencers. Our, our city officials, our county officials are like, how do we reach young people? They have all this misinformation about COVID. I'm not uh, naming that like our local officials are also spreading misinformation about COVID. Um, but our young people um, have access to one another, right? It is not uncommon for young people to have um, 3,000, 5,000, 8,000 followers, and some of our young people who are really active online have digital communities of 15 to 20,000 folks that they're connected to, both locally and um, across their areas of interest. And so by paying these young people who already have the social capital to engage with their peers and to spread information as trusted messengers, we were able to access more youth than our County Department of Public Health um, and then our city government. Um, and so we were really, um, proud of our young people for not only showing up to that, um, but showing up to it with a lot of vigor and um, creativity, um, a lot of design, a lot of art making, a lot of storytelling, um, young people really wanting to reclaim the narrative. And so um, there's a whole lot laced in, in challenges and hard things of having our space close and disconnection. Um, but I think I'll hold there um, to really sort of lift up, right, the, the vibrancy of our young people and um, their brilliance when we make space and resource them um, it really was a game changer. Great. Thank you, Ashley. You know, it really strikes me about your comments are a couple of things. One is, how do we support staff working in these organizations, right? Because they're under tremendous stress and greater demand. And uh, hearing you share some of the work you've done with your staff and creating space and time for them super important. And then secondly, just the importance of play and how do we create play in a virtual space? And tell me again, the video game that you used for that. It, it was my staff, uh, the teams, um, uh, they played Among Us, right? So it's a trendy game among young people. It's sort of like um, a murder mystery game. Um, and you go in, you can have different breakout groups and you have to figure out who's the, um, the bad guy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Next, we're going to move over to Antonio Delfino and, and uh, hear from Antonio in terms of how he's faced challenges in his work and how how's, how's, uh, he worked to adapt uh, his services to support young people. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having me. Audrey, for the invite. Uh, youth Forward, Alameda Boys, Men of Color. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd first like to start with just extending an affirmation to all of us for putting the work to engage our young people, uh, 2020 has been quite the year. Uh, we've endured a lot. I think we built some resilience, but it has been difficult. Um, so I just wanted to take a second to acknowledge all of us for the, the work that we're doing in the field. Um, as Jim mentioned, I'm Antonio Delfino. I'm a program manager with the California Health Collaborative. Uh, we're a statewide California 501c3 organization, and we serve underserved and underrepresented with a mission to change lives by improving health and wellness. Um, so to begin, I'd just like to share a bit about our Prop 64 funded program. Uh, that's through Sierra Health Foundation's Elevate Youth CA uh, initiative um, and get into some of the adaptations we've had to roll out uh, in light of COVID-19. So the Hill Project, a bit of background, we are a youth empowerment and substance use prevention program. Uh, we serve black and Latinx students in the city of, of Visalia. Uh, for those of you not familiar, uh, Visalia is in California's uh, Central Valley. Uh, we're considered an urban area, but we're an urban Central Valley area. If you've ever been, been to the Central Valley, you kind of, you'll know what I mean. Um, anyhow, Hill Project stands for Healing, Equity, Advocacy, and Leadership. Uh, what we aim to do is empower, build resilience, and elevate youth voices. Uh, we do that through the arts, leadership, and healing-centered engagement. Um, 
We received Olivade Youth CA funding. We were a cohort one recipient. Uh, go figure, we received that funding in, in March of, of last year, uh, right in the middle of the beginning of the pandemic. Um, again, I'll reiterate, you know, saying it was challenging would be a bit of, of an understatement. For, for some context, um, we're rolling out a, a brand new program um, in, a, in a relatively new service area in the middle of a pandemic and having to do so 100% virtually, um, as many of us have, have probably experienced. So what I wanna share today is, is some of the, the lessons or, or takeaways, if you will, what we have learned and more or less what we're continuing to learn. Um, what I'm gonna share is not, it, it's not entirely mine. This is things that our youth have really taught us. Um, my staff has taught me, um, so shout out to, to all of them. Um, but I'd say there are three primary takeaways um, in terms of learning lessons for COVID-19. Um, the first would be, let the youth guide you. Um, we have found that, I mean, youth recruitment is always a challenge, but doing it in March virtually was, was, was definitely a big hurdle. Um, Something that we found, and, and, and I'm lucky to have brought on staff who are very social media savvy, I will say, um, that was extremely beneficial. But even then, you know, looking at recruitment, it was like, what type of content do we want to develop? You know, what is going to resonate with youth, and particularly youth of color from low-income communities? Uh, we tried, we dibble dabbled here and there, but really what really was most beneficial, we lean in our, our youth. They know what is relevant. They understand social media. They understand marketing. Um, they informed our content and it really made it relevant to, to not only them and our program, but their peers. We found that to be hugely beneficial that they saw themselves on our page, right? Um, and really playing the role of, of a peer, not an expert, like certainly taking a step back and giving them that agency to, to build out sort of your program identity. They know what this should look like. So really letting the youth take a leadership role and, and guide the, the project and, and the initiative. Um, secondly, and this is from our youth telling us straight up, don't, don't water it down. When we were building uh, sort of this program out and developing our social media platforms and identity, um, it was sort of like, well, what, what, what's, again, the question of what do they want to hear? How do they want to hear it? What should it look like? And the takeaway was very clear and simple. Don't water it down. Tell it like it is. I think as a program, we have that responsibility. If we're going to talk about the war on drugs, talk about it, right? Talk about race. Talk about systemic racism. Talk about uh, mass incarceration in the school to prison pipeline. Give them the facts. Give them the data. Um, we're talking about Gen Z here, and my staff lays me up on what, what, what is Gen Z, right? And I think Ashley kind of hit on it. They are digital organizers. They have that fire. They want to get their hands dirty and, and put in work. Um, so I feel it, it was sort of our responsibility to just provide the vehicle and the space for them to make change. Let them, let them um, take a leadership capacity in terms of what are things that they want to see changed? What is what is what are these issues look like from their vantage point? Um, I think they are closest to the solution. So when it comes to an identity, don't don't water it down. We found that our youth really want the facts, and it's it, it is difficult. It is difficult to talk about racism, but we have to talk about it. We can't go around these things. We have to go go through them. Uh, my opinion. And lastly, and this is most important uh, from the bottom of my heart, just hold that space and, and, and build community. It's so important right now. Um, Ashley had mentioned too, it, it really does start with staff, making sure that they're taken care of, making sure that you're checking in with them. Um, it's bigger than the scope of work, I like to say. It, it really is. I know right now with COVID, there is a, a pressure, you know, to meet your numbers, meet your numbers, but if that's, you get caught up in that, you're not fully present for your staff. If you're not fully present for your staff, I feel like they won't be fully present for your program. And most importantly, the, the young people that we're trying to serve. So just creating those, those healing spaces where we can come together and, and build community and, and support each other. 
Um, lastly, that authentic and engagement is, is kind of tricky when you're doing everything online. Um, how do we build trust amongst each other within our program, with our youth? Um, and I, I think that's probably most important is that, again, don't get caught up in, in the numbers and, and the pressure of meeting everything. Just, just showing up, being yourself and being present over time is going to create that authentic engagement that I think ultimately will help retain students in your programs. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. That's sort of my opinion, my staff's opinion, and, and directly from our youth. These would probably be some of the three takeaways, if I could sum up sort right, of how we've adapted to COVID-19. So yeah, great. thank you. Thank you so much, Antonio. I appreciate your comment about the need to keep it real and don't water it down. And I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, George Galvis, a leader in his local community, is a leader across the state of California, and someone who definitely knows how to keep it real. So, George. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so, my name is George Galvis. I'm proud co-founder and executive director of Courage, Community United for Restorative Youth Justice, coming straight out of East Oakland, California. Um, and I just kind of would like to begin by saying, you know, my elders taught me that you don't really know where you're going unless you know where you've been. And so I think it's helpful maybe for us to take a moment to just kind of reflect on how we got here and really the context of Prop 64, the war on drugs, which was really a war on black and brown people, you know what I'm saying? And so, um, you know, what we know is that the war on, you know, the war on drugs, you know, um, essentially perpetuated state violence, police terrorism in black and brown communities. Um, it criminalized black and brown folks and it absolutely expanded mass incarceration. Um, and so, you know, those are really kind of the three buckets that my organization works in. Our mission is to really uh, support, the, unlock the leadership of young people to dream beyond bars. And our young people, you know, we elevate the voice and power of formerly incarcerated and currently incarcerated systems impacted young people, young adults, and their families. Um, so in that context, I think it's important to kind of just talk the, about the nitty gritty of Prop 64, which, you know, we legalized um, adult use of marijuana, of cannabis, um, I'm a recipient and a beneficiary of Prop 64 funding also with the Elevate Youth um, Initiative um, out of Sierra Health Foundation. And I, frankly, um, I think it's an excellent first baby step, but really that's just a small baby step in terms of reparations to black and brown communities for the devastation that the war on drugs, you know, uh, had on black and brown uh, communities and destabilizing black and brown families particularly. So um, one thing I think it's important for a lot of folks to know too, is that the legalization of cannabis, you know, created an opportunity for a lot of white guys, you know, white men now to kind of line up and get rich off that legalization. And yet, you know, previously that subsidized a lot of black and brown families in the underground economy. And so a lot of young people and what we're seeing now in terms of um, most crime that's happening um, in California is that they're really crimes of survival um, because some of that subsidy is no longer in the family or in the community. And so folks are now kind of resorting to pulling licks. And pulling licks means like robberies, you know what I mean? Breaking into somebody's house, um, muggings, things like that. And so um, I just think it's important for us to always be mindful of some of the unintended consequences, negative externalities associated with everything. And that we need to go much further in terms of you know, decriminalizing um, controlled substances, taking a harm reduction approach and really making sure that the reparations are going back into black and brown communities. And so that's a good segue for me to kind of talk a little bit about the way we leaned in and sort of the pandemic era. And, you know, really, you know, we're a social impact organization first and foremost. Um, I wouldn't describe us as youth development. I think in the youth engagement spectrum, we're youth organizing, um, you know, youth, um, you know, really kind of, if you think about youth, you know, the youth engagement spectrum, it really kind of begins with just sort of direct services to young people then youth development, then youth leadership, then civic engagement, and really kind of the highest level of empowerment, you know, um, is what we would describe as youth organizing. And so, you know, that's where we're really trying to address the systemic problems and get to the root causes, you know what I mean? And we believe that those who are closest to the pain are closest to the solution and we're the experts of our own lives. And so um, that said, you know, we've tried to lean in to try to make sure that we are putting money into the pockets of our young people, where we could pull on core operating support, where we could increase stipends. Thankfully, we were, I think, in a very unique position that we had really been preparing um, more really for the 2020 election and all the kind of tech activism 
and kind of integrated voter engagement. We are learning all these tech tools over the last year, year and a half to kind of prep for the 2020 election as really more of a power building strategy, but it put us in a really good position to be able to pivot to really sort of virtual platforms with our young people. Automatically, we started buying tons of digital equipment. We bought, you know, a bunch of Chromebooks. We paid for Wi-Fi for their homes. And then we started doing things that like really are outside of our scope and mission, but that's what we do. You know what I'm saying? We have to basically respond to the needs of our community. We started doing food distribution and our young people would participate in some of that too, in terms of bagging up the food, some of the deliveries, all of that. So that happened. And then what also happened was a George Floyd movement and movement for Breonna Taylor and defund the police. You know what I'm saying? And so our young people started hitting the streets, you know what I mean? And I'm going to be honest, man, like, you know, I'd have been right out there from jump if I was still a youngster, but initially, like, you know, I, I don't know what it is as we get older, where we, uh, we become a little more um, complacent or some shit, you know, excuse my language, but, you know, uh, initially, man, I was depressed sitting on my sofa watching CNN news was I wasn't on a damn Zoom meeting because I was doing 12-hour Zoom meetings and all kinds of other stuff, you know, as soon as the pandemic hit and shelter in place. It's crazy how as soon as all the conferences and travel and commute time got canceled that my schedule actually got busier. I just, you know, I couldn't figure it out. But when I wasn't doing that and I'm watching CNN and getting depressed because we're constantly being berated with, you know, images of black and brown bodies being dehumanized and seen as disposable and police murdering us with impunity, um, feeling sort of this sense of helplessness. It was our young people who hit the streets, 15,000 strong. They declared, you know, it was youth led out here in Oakland. Some of our young people, you know, put out a call in Oakland for a youth march that was 15,000 strong. And they marched beautifully. They marched par powerfully and they marched peacefully. And the way that that was, um, the way that the city of Oakland chose to kind of interface with them is that there was a curfew at 2 p.m. that nobody knew about that was declared by the sheriff uh, for 6 p.m. And at 5 p.m., Oakland police, along with all those joint mutual kind of collaborators, all the other neighboring law enforcement agencies, decided to open fire with rubber bullets and tear gas on our young people. And it was our young people, many of our eight homies for justice, Dream Beyond Bars fellows, including my own daughter, who were pelted with rubber bullets, had bruises all up and down their bodies, had been tear gassed, and were arrested and charged. And of course, our mayor and our city tried to deny this immediately and said that there was no police violence, that there was, that none of this had taken place, but we got the video, we got the receipts. And as a result of that, we organized an action two days later. As adults, we felt like we had an incumbent responsibility. And I'm sharing this anecdote to say that this is really an example of how the young people were leading and getting the adults off our butts, you know what I'm saying? So we had an incumbent responsibility. So we had an action and we threw a block party that started a minute after the curfew started in the city of Oakland called Fuck Your Curfew. And we had 10,000 people show up right in front of Oakland City Hall. And we kept partying and basically uh, defying the um, Oakland curfew until about 3, 3 a.m. And the very next day they lifted the curfew. From that point, we continued to march. We continued to rally. We continued to engage in nonviolent direct action with our young people. It was youth led, adult supported and elder guided. You know, we drew on lessons, we leveraged our infrastructure, our 501c3, we lectured the resources we have, the PA system, the security, we mentored the young people to really translate their righteous rage into substantive policy demands and systems change. And we started showing up to every city council member's house in the morning, doing what we called wake up calls to the mayor's house to demand to defund OPD. And as a result of that, finally they caved in and said that they were gonna reduce the Oakland police budget by 50% and create a reimagining uh, public safety task force. And that's kind of where we're at with that right now. But this is inextricably connected to the campaign that was happening even pre-COVID, which was our close, you know, really dream beyond bars with the tagline of close youth prisons, build youth leaders. So uh, that's just an example of really how our young people are leading. Um, what I'll also just kind of say is that it's been extremely difficult. So as much as we were out there on the streets, and during a time of that they were demanding shelter in place, we had to respond to the other pandemic of, you know, um, you know anti-blackness, of uh, police terrorism in our communities. And so um, 
there wasn't much I could do. I'm not an epidemiologist, so I couldn't necessarily do anything on the COVID tip besides pass out PPE and do some of the health education outreach. But I, I'm an organizer and I could be out there to demand justice for our communities around police terrorism and that epidemic. So or I should say pandemic. So I'll stop there and just kind of make it more dialogical. If there's folks who got questions, folks who want to build with us, you know, what I will say is we had young people and it was our young people who were laced up and on social media. Like I'm not on TikTok, you know what I mean? But they're out there doing like clever little videos and things and they're politicizing those spaces, you know what I mean? And they're doing it with humor in a really powerful and beautiful way. And as a result of that, I, we had young people from all over the state hitting us up, asking us for support because they wanted to have a Black Lives Matters rally. They wanted to have a defund the police rally or march or action. And, you know, we just started trying to lean in you know, um, you know, just to kind of make sure that those young people were being supported in these efforts. Great. Great. Thank you very much, George, for sharing all of that amazing work. Um, as we've looked through the comments, we have had some questions around, again, going back to this theme of staff burnout and how to staff sustain work. So I wanted to follow up with you, George, given the intensity of your work, the uh, work on uh, defund the police, the George Floyd protests, and then with the pandemic on top of that, how do you, how do you find, so what, what have you been doing to support yourself and your staff to be able to sustain that kind of intensity? Well, I, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's, there's been a number of challenges, but we've also seen this, I think it's important to point out that 2019 was a record breaking year in terms of lowest crime rates that we've experienced in the state of California. This was a pattern across the nation in like about 50 years. 2019. Now, between 2019 and 2020, there's been no change in any of the police budget. So despite a lot of our marching around demanding defund police, it's important for people to note that their budgets have not changed as of yet. But in 2020, we did see a spike in crime. So what did change? Well, the pandemic, obviously. And I believe that what there was was sort of a social emotional climate that really kind of um, trickled down because of what we began to see was corruption, white supremacy, uh, you know, from the highest levels of power in this nation, we began to see these images of black and brown bodies being dehumanized, and it created this sense of hopelessness. And then the black and brown communities that are the most impacted by these were also most impacted financially by the pandemic. You know what I mean? Those were the jobs that ended up getting kind of cut off. And so um, it created a desperation and a social emotional climate, and we've seen a spike in both violence and in crime in 2020 since March. That said, we've had to bury some young people. I've had some young people who got killed in East Oakland in this time. And we had to hold healing space. And we couldn't, that's not something you can do virtually. You know what I mean? It's like really intimate. And, um, and it's very important that we be able to really support and facilitate a healing journey for our young people because unresolved you know, pain becomes anger and unresolved anger becomes rage and unresolved rage are, becomes violence. And so this is how we address those root causes. And so we had to hold memorials, we had to hold healing space. And the best we could do is pass out PPE, even though we have young people who just need to be hugged and we're being told we got to maintain six feet. You know what I mean? So there were some challenges and we weren't necessarily always perfect in terms of practice. Um, in terms of my own practice, I mean, you know, this is a way of life. This isn't, you know, just a job. It's not a nine to five. We're not weekend warriors. We're not you know, um, you know, and so, you know, what my elders have taught me is that even though for me, like my annual renewal comes in the summer through our Sundance ceremony, and I'm very connected to my traditional Native American rituals and ceremonies. And, um, but, um, but it really, the ceremony that we're taught really begins after Sundance. And it's the way we carry ourselves every day, the way we greet that sun in the morning, taking a moment to just bless ourselves and smudge ourselves, the way we acknowledge and greet our family and the people we love, the way we take a moment in the evening to smudge ourselves again and give thanks and let go of all those things that don't serve us and, you know, and have gratitude and appreciation for the gifts in our lives and the blessings. And so, you know, those are practices that as much as I know, I think I was ripping and running so hard that I let go of. And then in the midst of this pandemic, I had to re get, you know, reroute myself, reroute myself to those things. So. Great. Great. Thank, thank you so much, George, for sharing that and sharing your own personal practice. And I, I, th I have a sense that Ashley has something to say about this because I know this is space she's also very active in. Sorry, I'm uh, dodging this like glare. So 
Um, you know, I think hearing um, hearing George and all his brilliance just now, I found myself really sort of going through my own flashbacks of all those moments in our community because it's um, nearly parallel to what we experienced this summer. Um, and I would say um, it, 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 in December was the first opportunity that I had to really sort of stop and reflect on um, this like massive high powered fast moving train that was 2020 that just sort of kept going. Um, and what we realized was um, that like we were all carrying a whole lot of um, trauma and like a whole lot of wound from just continuing to move um, and continuing to respond and continuing um, to show up. And so um, I think for us, it really is sort of putting us in this position of long term, right? Like when we're training young people as organizers, as system change leaders, as, as thought leaders, um, you know, the importance of also training in um, the care, the connection, the community, um, but but really this this concept of really deepening um, the idea of like informed consent. What does it mean for young people to organize against white supremacy in the Central Valley, um, where um, we have electeds who reflect a lot of the values of um, uh, of white supremacy? And and what does it mean to have your name out there, your face out there as a young person in this work? Um, what does it mean if your parents are undocumented, um, your family? And so um, I think really sort of centering and and um, pushing us to this place of really examining and deepening our preparation for, for collective safety and wholeness as we continue to do our work. Um, I really do feel a little activated just in hearing George because it is sort of reactivating my experience of that last year. And so I just also want to sort of take a big breath and like, oh, it was so much and it is still so much because this year, 2021, um, started off with more racial trauma. Um, we saw what happened at the Capitol um, ahead of it, the inauguration, um, and I think like really acknowledging the depth of that racial of that racialized trauma and what it means to be carrying it and to be a person experiencing it and working in it and um, supporting other young people in it. Um, and so, I think it's um, the depth of the experience is something I'm still learning from, and is something I'm still um, integrating. For myself um, because there were certainly moments that like like George said where I fell off my own healing practices um, because we were so deep in um, all the response you know working um, evenings because I still have to fundraise for uh, the org and write grants and we still have all this action happening at the community level so um, it it is something that I think we're still learning from and it's something that I hope we continue as a field to um, continue to um, analyze and plan forward. I know for me it was relationships with funders that I could say, hey, I need flexible support dollars right now because I've got to put money in the pockets of our kids. I need laptops um, or this whole thing is going to fall apart. Um, and it was really those relationships and that level of honesty and transparency that I had with, um, you know, funders who are, who are really, you know, co-conspirators in the work that we're doing. Like they're planning this with us. Um, and so, really leaning into the trust and into the whole network. Um, as a young executive director leading this work in the Central Valley, um, it was really scary at times. Um, and so leaning on partners across the state, leaning on resources um, and really um, doing all the back end work so that we could show up for young people. I think um, I think where we really have tons more to learn from as a field, and I hope that we can do that. Right. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. You know, I think what's one thing that's really important about what you're saying and what we've been hearing in, over the last hour is just naming part of the reality that people leading organizations are facing. And I think by naming it and naming what your experience has been, I'm sure there's a lot of nodding heads out there among people who are watching this because it's not a conversation we have that much in the youth development field. We're all about supporting other people. How do we deal with this ourselves? You know, I think that's super important. Um, uh, so I'm gonna start headed towards wrapping up now. Um, 
And in closing, I'd like to mention a couple things. Um, first, this is not the last you will hear from us uh, regarding this area of research and youth development, youth organizing in the virtual space. How do we sustain ourselves and grow the field? We'll be publishing a paper uh, on the findings and on the conversations we've had in this session with the help of our amazing researcher, Audrey Jordan, and sharing it with, with everyone who would register for the ses um, session. We're also going to explore having future sessions, perhaps at the regional level on this topic. How do we continue to create this space we've had over the last hour for people in the field to connect and explore these really critical themes. And if you have thoughts about how, how we should move forward, please do share those with us. We would love your feedback. Please be in touch with us. Um, and then finally, I'd like to call your attention to our upcoming sessions in this series. Um, you'll see that uh, our next session, which is on Tuesday of next week, has to do with equity in California's marijuana industry. So in his comments, George mentioned this transfer of wealth we're witnessing from an underground economy to a corporate economy dominated by white entrepreneurs and investors. That is a big part of the cannabis racial equity conversation. And we're fortunate that on next Tuesday, we'll have some of the, some of the leading uh, entrepreneurs of color, black entrepreneurs who are working in the space and challenging uh, our uh, state government and local governments and challenging the industry to, to create space uh, and to uh, repair some of the harm that's happened through the war on drugs through economic development. Uh, the next Thursday, we're gonna have a session on local cannabis taxes. So I, you know, earlier you heard about the session we did on state cannabis tax revenue and, and uh, the grant programs that have been created. On Thursday, we're gonna look at what's happening with local government. And unfortunately, uh, what we've seen in our research is that local government is capturing significant new tax dollars and are dedicating those tax dollars to expand law enforcement uh, and to fund general government rather than investing those dollars in black and brown communities. So that's gonna be a really critical session. And then you can see the other upcoming sessions around um, public health, coalition building, and then finally, one on healing-centered and trauma-informed approaches, which is definitely loops back into this conversation that we've had um, this morning. And we're at, we have some terrific folks presenting uh, on that theme um, for that final session. So thank you again for joining us and we look forward to staying in touch and hopefully we'll see you uh, on some of these upcoming sessions. And many thanks in particular to our panelists and our guest presenters today. Thank you.